Hey everyone, this is Tristan Rendo, founder and editor of Clearance Bin Review, along with staff writer Steve Lesniewski. Today we are talking with XNA developers and the minds and driving force behind the third indie game uprising, Michael Hicks and Dave Voiles. Thank you very much guys for taking time to chat with us. For those who aren't familiar, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves. Michael, why don't you go ahead and start off first. Okay. Uh... Well, my name is Michael. I'm an XBLIG developer. I started developing uh, last year uh, when I turned 18 in January. And I, my first game was Iron Vengeance. And I followed up with Iron Vengeance 2 later uh, that August. And now I'm back with a new game called Sententia. And I'm here with Dave uh, trying to do this uprising thing. And I've been keeping pretty busy. So <laughs> that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Yeah, and Dave? Uh, I started off as a journalist for a site called Armus Octopus that I started a few years ago with about four or five other friends. And then I slowly made the transition to, I guess, promoting and marketing Xbox Indie games through last year's Summer Uprising. So it's my uh, second rodeo. And I'm also struggling to develop games in XNA and Unity right now, too. So uh, my first game, Pizong, is going to hit <laughs> X-Blig in uh, probably a couple of weeks. I'm just doing some debugging right now. All right, sounds good. Um, so let's get started here. Uh, first and foremost, what made you guys decide to go forward with Indie Game Uprising 3? Uh, you well, you want to do that one, Dave? Or? No, no, you're the mastermind behind this one, so. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's see. It all started back when I was finishing up my latest game, Sententia, because last year, uh, when I was finishing up Iron Vengeance 2, I was submitting to the Summer Uprising, and that was going on real strong. So I was like, well, I wonder if they're going to do another Uprising this year. And uh, I kind of talked to Dave, and I'm friends with Alex Jordan, who was in the last promotion. And it just kind of seemed that it might not happen. So I, I kind of went to App Hub, and I posted a thread. And I was like, hey, is there interest uh, in, the in the community to do this? And Dave dropped by and said he'd like to get involved, and some other developers dropped by. And uh, we just kind of went from there, and the public interest has been real strong. And, and it's just it's worked out really nice, I think. So, so basically a uh, shameless self-promotion on your part? Kinda, yeah. I guess, I guess you could say that, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, how does this, uh, how is this one differing from uh, the last one? You know, what's, what are we doing differently about, you know, in terms of promotion and setting it up? Well, we have one less uh, game this time. We have nine instead of ten. Uh, <laughs> but also, um, I think we learned a lot of lessons from the last one, which helped us to be a bit more organized this time around. Um, gave us a bit more lead time, and the last one was uh, a bit rushed, I guess, because we we're trying to make that summer deadline. But this time we went into it with a clear idea of when we had to have these games submitted, as far as how the developers stood and whether or not they could realistically hit that timeline, which seems to be late summer, early fall. Um, so yeah, definitely taking all the experiences in the last one and passing them along to this this one, and certainly certainly looking to play out a bit better and much smoother than uh, the previous summer uprising. So when did you start planning? Uh, this this year's uprising. Ooh, well, uh, Mike mm. Mike had actually started in the forums. I don't know when did you bring this up? Maybe May? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking like early May, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. Mike had like initialized the the idea in the App Hub forums, and uh, I didn't really want to do it at first because I was kind of burnt out from the last one. Um, and then slowly it kind of grew on me as we started getting more developers on board. And finally, I said, yeah, let's do it again. So it was definitely Mike, <laughs> you know, as the catalyst and, and the one for starting this this project again. Um, and yeah, we just kind of took it from there and, and over the few months we gradually got more developers on board, helped spread the word through the app hub, which is Microsoft's official forum for Xbox and D developers. And, um, as it got larger and larger, we slowly had them pick out what we thought, or they believed to be some of the best uh, entries for Microsoft's annual dream play, dream build play competition. So Microsoft so, actually had a hand in uh, picking out some of the games in this one? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Um, Developers had submitted their games okay, to their gotcha. competition, and from there we could uh, like sort through the database and see the videos, the games, uh, and information on these developers. So developers gradually submitted some of their titles or what they believed to be some of the best ones into this conversation. And from there, we, as a community, began to gather what we thought would be some of the, the highlighted games. And once we had a, a solid four or five developers, we started our little email chain or email thread. It uh, spoke amongst ourselves, and that's how we got the last few on board. Now, how did, you know, refresh my memory, how did uh, you guys go about selecting the games for the last uprising? Ooh, for the last one, how do we, it was basically a, a very democratic process, uh, even more so than this time around. Uh, it was Chris Steele, who had really got this one going, um, and fortunately he came back to help us out with the website again this time, so I want to thank him for that, because he, he yep. owns and manages all the, the web services for us. Yep. So, uh, 
the last time around, we basically did the same thing, went to the forums and said, do you want this? Do you want that? Um, and yeah, I guess that was basically the same process. Oh, oh, I remember. I'm sorry. I, I've got so much going on with this thing. It's difficult to remember sometimes. <laughs> and you would think I, I, I gave a speech on this at GDC. So you think I have it down <laughs> by now. <laughs> yeah. 80, 80 PowerPoint slides later. Um, yeah, right. Okay. So for the last one, that's what happened. All the game developers submitted whichever games they were making at the moment. So we had like over 80 of them in the first day. So what we did was put them all in one Google spreadsheet of a bit of information about all of them. So we'd say, hey, look, submit your screenshots, uh, a gameplay trailer, and um, the build file if you do have one so, so we can deploy it to our own Xboxes and play them. So for that promotion, it came down to myself, Chris Steele, and two other um, journalists, Scott Nichols, who's a freelancer for just about every site you've ever read, and Ryan Donnelly, who runs VVG TV, and also handles our trailers. So amongst ourselves, we uh, narrowed it down to 25, and then from that 25, we submitted it back to the developer community and said, hey, look, you guys pick it from here. Give us uh, what you believe to be eight of the best titles, and this way, you know, we don't have full control over it. I never wanted it to be uh, about one person having more control than anyone else. So we just tried to narrow down the results. So this way, everyone kind of had a fair shot, and it'd be too much to expect all these developers to play 80 titles. We're 25 that's somewhat more reasonable. So that's how we uh, narrowed down to the uh, the last iteration. You know, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember last year there being a little bit more of an emphasis on uh, genre variety. Is that something that was uh, an emphasis this time around, or was it just about trying to find the best games that you could find for the channel? Yeah, well, I mean, we were, th- we're... Oh, sorry, Dave, were you going to say something? No, no, I was asking you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> we just tried to find, like, games that looked great and played great i mean we went to the some of the games were in play testing at the app hub forum so we had the chance to actually go out and play these games and kind of do it in a private manner so we just went through and picked the games that we thought were great you know i mean we try i mean we definitely tried to get some variety but i mean if that meant cutting a great game then we weren't really going to do that it was just about finding good games i think how many entries did you guys have this year you said last year it was about 80 you had to start off with how many did you guys start off for this year Ooh, i don't know if there's a clear number just because it wasn't so much entries as it was people just going to the forum and dropping in what they thought were some of the best games. So I really couldn't, couldn't say it to tell you the truth. Yeah, well, I mean, you could go to the thread and count. It was, we pretty much just picked from the thread kind of deal. Yeah. Okay, um, I brought it up earlier. I misunderstood something you said. But uh, what role has Microsoft played so far for you guys, or if any? Mm, well, they can't, they can't really promote us too much simply because of the agreements and contracts they have with um, you know, XBLA developers and everything else. So it's difficult, if you imagine, for them to promote one service, which we only pay $100 annually for, and not promote um, XBLA developers who pay, you know, tons and tons of money to be published on that platform. So there are no guarantees at the moment for anything, just as it, it was in the, the previous entries. But, um, you know, we would like to believe that there's the possibility of having another dashboard promotion. So we're in talks at the moment, but again, nothing is guaranteed and we we really don't know. All we can do is kind of play our cards right and put ourselves in the best position. And we're doing that by informing the XNA team, um, in addition to Edelman, who handles all the PR for Microsoft and Dream Build Play. But finally, we assured them that we're going to have all these games um, ready and available and pass peer, uh, peer review, which is the uh, gaming application process. So once it passed peer review, these games are good to go. We're just waiting to hit the publish button and put them on the service. So once that's all done, we have a bit more negotiating power. Yeah, and, and, and to be fair, I mean, Microsoft, they seem to have had a pretty big interest in this thing from the start. Cause, because I remember when I posted the thread, Dave said that someone from Microsoft had gotten in contact with him. So I, I think that they're interested, for sure, in what we're doing. And Dave, you said you've been working on this for a couple of years. Uh, can you tell me exactly how, how many, or have you been this from the start, or did you just start up last year with uh, Uprising? The first Uprising was started by Robert Boyd of Z-Boyd Games. So he just made uh, the Penny Arcade title. Um, and also Ian Stalker, who goes by Magical Time Bean. Um, that's his development studio. So they kind of started this two years ago. Yeah, two Decembers ago. It was a, a way of cross moding their titles before they got other friends and developers on board. Where this time, um, they you know gave us the reins to kind of take them and, and do as we pleased for at least the summer version and finally a third uprising. It's a little bit different, that process, but... At the same time, I think we definitely got better media coverage and it went a little smoother 
the second time around than did the first. So I guess to uh, veer away a little bit from the uprising in and of itself, where do you guys see the uh, you know the Xbox Live indie game market in you know the next generation or in the future, even if it's maybe not necessarily on an Xbox? I know XNA is uh, also a pretty powerful platform for uh, PC development. Well, yeah, Mike, this is all you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I don't really know. I mean, no one really knows like what's going to happen. But I mean, I I think the market is growing slowly but surely, right? I mean, I, I think there's the user base for XBLIG is slowly going up. Like when when the article on Joystick was posted, I think it was Joystick. There was somebody in the comments section like defending XBLIG because somebody was like, oh wow, a bunch of quality games for once. And somebody was like, are you kidding me, XBLIG? Like they, they were defending the channel. I mean, like I've never seen that happen ever. So, right, I mean, I'd like to think that it, everything's growing and the public awareness is growing. And I, I'd like to think that if that's happening, then we'll see XBLIG on the next Xbox and we'll kind of see all this continue. And I, I, there's rumors for XNA5 too, but I mean, no one really knows. We'll just have to see, you know. But I, I, it's good that we're playing a part doing the uprising and, you know, trying to make some effort to uh, see all this continue. Mm -hmm. um, I would have to say I probably agree with you in the increased awareness, um, even just like on a personal level. You know, I've got a lot of friends who game, they own Xboxes, and the uh, number of them who were even familiar with the channel or what it was about, uh, you know, two years ago was more or less not at all. And yeah. it's increasingly, you know, I can go up to someone I know who games and I can say something about an Xbox Live indie game, and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 you know, and they know what I'm talking about, which was definitely not true two years ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And even at school, like when I came down here to college, I mentioned something about XBLIG and like the kids around here, they, they know, they're they aware of like the uprising titles and whatnot. I'm like, wow, that's, that's awesome. You know, I mean, I, I think it's growing. It's pretty exciting. So I, I guess with the increased awareness of the Xbox Live indie game market, uh, do you think that the Wii or the PlayStation might develop a similar indie market I mean, on par with Xbox own? Uh, Dave, you want to answer that? Or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd like to... I would like to imagine that in the very near future that they would, the other developers, or I should say other large gaming companies would hop on board as well. I mean, sure, there's WiiWare, but that kind of came uh, later on in Nintendo's life in that they, they're they just beginning to acknowledge the fact that the internet exists, um, which may be a little too little too late. But, I mean, I would love to see other platforms take the reins, kind of like what X Xplig did, because five years ago it was like promised as like the next big thing, and it fulfilled in some of those promises, but fell very short in others. And I think what largely contributed to that was the fact that Microsoft was unaware of how successful it would be or how it would take off. And again, Sony's starting to kind of do the same thing, where they have Indie Pub Fund, where they um, back developers for creating independent games, but they tend to have a, a large issue with their branding and marketing. Um, so they have, you know, the Vita, the PSP, PS3. There's so many things that they can't even keep track of them. For example, like PSN isn't even a thing anymore. Um, they, they actually completely renamed that um, in January. And then I guess no one picked up on it. So they just kind of stuck with PSN. <laughs> it's actually called SEN now, Sony Entertainment Network. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if you go look up like SEN, that, that's a real thing. But they... No one really got the memo about that, despite being covered on sites. So, right. <laughs> but, I mean, it's true. And then when I bring it up to people, they're like, I don't think that's a real thing. And I'm like, no, no it is. It just kind of fell short on their branding. So if Sony can get its act together, then they can definitely take a charge. And they're starting to put things in the right spots. I mean, they have the Vita um, SDK available now, and you can use C Sharp to develop on that as well. And C Sharp is a language that XNA developers use. So with that in mind, a lot of these games can come over with some work, but at the same time, it's not like you have to literally rewrite the whole thing from scratch. So if we have uh, platforms in the future, and hopefully in the next generation that begin to adopt this as well, then we have a, a, a good lookout for things. Yeah, I mean, we were asked this question, we did an interview before this, and someone asked me that, and I, and I, I think people typically look at WiiWare as kind of like the indie equivalent of XBLIG on the Wii or whatever, and except that it has the barrier. So, I mean, yeah, I, I'd like to see like more uh, barrierless platforms. But, I mean, we'll see what happens. I really don't know what will happen. You know. <laughs> oh, talking about the barriers, what, I mean, from the three, is Xbox the easiest to get your content on? Uh, I know that the phones are fairly easy. I'm guessing is the Xbox second and PlayStation and the Wii? Or what's your opinion on that? Like, you mean how easy it is to develop or just like how, like the barriers, like the gatekeeper type of thing? I guess from a development standpoint and as to get it on the actual marketplace. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I, I'd say... There's nothing better than X and A, 
but I guess I'm kind of biased because I've been using it forever. Uh, I've never done iPhone development or anything like that, but from what I hear, it's pretty easy to get your stuff up and running on that as well. Um, it's, I mean, pretty much anybody, I mean, if you pay the fee and, you know, know how the program and whatnot, anybody can make a game for the uh, XBLIG if they, you know, put some effort in kind of thing. And it's, aw it's awesome that's like that. I really I appreciate Microsoft giving that kind of, you know, platform. Yeah, I mean, if you if you had told me, uh, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years ago when I just started playing games, hey, you, in 15 or 20 years, you can make a game on a console and have all your friends play it. I would have never believed that would be possible. But, yeah. you know, Microsoft really you know took control and made that possible. But like I said, they fell short in some areas, and they really could bring it back to life if they took control in the right ways. Um, but, yeah, they, they do a lot of the grunt work for you as, as, long as, as well as the framework. So the framework really helps us to get our games up on PC, Xbox, and the Windows phone with relative ease. Um, so if you're a programmer, it's not that not that bad. But if you're someone who's not used to programming, you may have a very difficult time with it. You said uh, kind of bringing it back to life. Do you think the uh, if like PlayStation, Nintendo, they start really kind of treating an open-ended uh, developer channel like Xbox Live Indie Games for their systems, as a po real possibility, do you think there you could see Xbox or you would see Xbox uh, starting to fa uh, funnel a lot more attention into their own? Yes, absolutely. I mean, look at all the attention that the uh, Ouya, Ouya has grabbed in the last couple of weeks. Right? Yeah, I'm not sure how to pronounce that either. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all kind of in the air, right? We're, we're, right. I don't think anyone is. But, um, I mean, you see the popularity of that, and that is essentially what Xplig is, right? It's uh, it, not really an open marketplace, but somewhat – it's somewhat curated, but still, it's an easy to develop platform on that people want to have their indie games, uh, you know, available for. Where you're not really competing head to head with the triple A's, and for the most part, we're not having to do that with um, X League. In some ways, we are because it's obviously the same console, but at the same time, the marketplace is directly saturated with independent games by small indie developers. So, what more could you ask? You know, Mike, do you feel the same way when when you were creating some of your games? Well, I mean. I, wait, what was the original question? I, kind of, I lost it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What did we start with? Uh, was uh, the uh, other systems in, going to a similar... Oh, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Uh, I think Microsoft probably would give make more fixes and whatnot. But the thing is, they, they are making changes and whatnot. I mean, like earlier this year, they uh, they allowed us to... Like the size limit of our games before, if we were over 50 megabytes, we'd automatically have to price jack our game up to like $3. And they raised that at the beginning of the year to 150 megabytes. So that, that gives us more, because a lot of people, they want to sell their games that are like 200 meg at a, the $1 price point kind of thing. So, I mean, they're making changes for us that we're asking for, just not as fast as what a lot of developers would like, I think. But, I mean, if, the, if there was some direct competition, like on the PlayStation and the Wii or whatever, then I think, yeah, I, I agree with Dave. I think they'd probably make more uh, changes faster and whatnot. I have to agree with Dave, too, when I read the uh, Oil's original kickstarter campaign i remember thinking to myself that basically it was uh the the it was xbox live indie games only without peer review um yeah that it was essentially the system they were talking about creating was that and that was it definitely caught my attention when it got as popular as it did for the simple fact of there was just that much support out you know coming out from the community for it yeah and it makes me wonder how much uh how much is really, you know, Xbox Live indie games, if you want to say they're struggling, comes from just people simply not being more aware of it? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I, we'll see how the OI or whatever does. I mean, I've seen a lot of people, people seem to think it's a joke, and other people are really amped up about it. I'm really curious to see how well it does. So it, it'll be exciting to see. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt that it's going to be interesting to see when it actually comes out and how it performs and how people who didn't sign up for it in the Kickstarter uh, react to it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I feel like uh, we're kind of hinting at this, and it's one of my questions I kind of had planned, um, is what we want to, what would you guys consider success for the uprising? What would, you know, what would define it as being something that, you know, you're happy with how it went, and you consider it, you know, just well, a success. I don't know why I'm going on any further. No, 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 it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for me, uh, me and Dave might have different views on this, but for me, I would just like to see more people checking out XBLIG in general. And also, it'd be nice to see the developers that are involved move on to platforms and help get their name out a little more. Like, I'm not really, you know, I, I, one of the main reasons why a lot of people didn't want to do another uprising, I think, was because the sales were mixed last time. And, I, I, you know, I think that'll be the last thing to happen. Like, I think we need to focus on building awareness. Then hopefully we can see some nice sales and all that good stuff afterwards, you know. 
What do you think, Dave? I'm kind of in the same boat. You know, I, I'm not really concerned with sales as I, I know they'll come, but then again, what we're kind of selling here isn't necessarily what X League is all about either, or what really sells best on X League. Um, right. So I, I'd be more satisfied with seeing these developers get their work out there, um, have their work appreciated, but then also hopefully hop on the bigger and larger platforms in the future. So you know, I want to see yeah. guys go to Steam or maybe get an XBLA contract or, or not necessarily with these titles, but maybe with their future games. So that's yeah. that's my goal. As long as people are made aware of XBLIG, what it has to offer and these developers, then it's a, a win in my book. Yeah, so awareness for the uh, developers themselves and the channel in general is the ultimate goal. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Um, and you mentioned last year and all that and some mixed sales. And I know, uh, you know Q Things Dying Violently was probably the standout title from last year in terms of both reviews and sales. And he just yeah. recently released for PC. And so, yeah, I yeah. mean, that's kind of a, an example of last year, even though it may not necessarily have gone as how everybody wanted, an uh, example of something that's kind of gone exactly with what you're shooting for. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so with that in mind, uh, do you guys foresee there being a, assuming there's an Xbox Live Indie Game channel to promote in, in the future, do you foresee this being something of a you know regular occurrence in the future, is this, or is that something that uh, you're just too far out to even really start planning on? Uh, well, I mean, I'd like to keep doing this, and Dave and myself, we've kind of talked about maybe doing one in the winter, but I mean, we don't know. Like, we have to get through this one first, right? But uh, once <laughs> once all this kind of calms down, uh, we'll see what happens. You know, I'd, I'd love to do another one because I've had a real blast doing this. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I would consider doing another one again. I mean, my concern is do people get tired of these after a while, you know, especially with uh, the number of other bundles that are out there. Um, so the market can you know, begins to get saturated with too many bundles at once. But at the same time, we're unique in that we are just geared towards this one specific platform by developers who use one framework. Uh, so, you know, I guess this depends on whether or not Microsoft will continue to support XBlig in the future. At this point, it's up in the air. We haven't had any additions to the framework in uh, some time now. And they're, like, slowly ramping down the size of their XNA team, so we really don't know. I think... At the moment, they're just not sure of how to handle this or how to move forward or whether or not it will move forward. So only time will tell. But for the most part, I think journalists are kind of speculating that the next console will hit market um, holiday 2013. So we have about nine months or a year realistically before we really have any idea of what's going to happen with uh, Xbox Live Indies. But I know they do have a dashboard update coming in a few months, so uh, we'll see what that does for x does, does that uncertainty, uh, the the future, does that scare you or worry you at all? Mm, well, on one hand it does, on the other hand it doesn't. We have uh, other options, for example, Mono Game, which is uh, an open source addition to XNA, which allows developers to kind of tap in and, and use XNA to create games on other platforms, like uh, mobile devices, like iOS or Android. Um and they've really done a great job of, of getting it working so far. I mean, obviously all the kinks aren't worked out, but um, between that and additionally the Sunburn gaming engine, which is a great 3D uh, tool and engine for making, uh, obviously, 3D games in XNA, they have uh, quite a few promising features and a lot in the pipeline at the moment. So between those two, we've got a bit to work with. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident it's not going away in the very near future, but long-term... Uh, not a bad place to start because if you know C sharp, you can do quite a few things. I mean, would you agree, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, when I came down to the school, like I've ne I had never done C plus plus, but I was experienced with C sharp, and I was amazed at like it's pretty much the same thing. So, so I mean, I, I, C sharp's a nice language to know, you know. Oh yeah, as long as you know something .net, it'll help you out with so much in the future. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. <clears throat> All right, Michael, since uh, you do actually have a game in the uprising, I figure I might as well take the. Uh opportunity to get you to talk about it a little bit and uh, okay start there yeah sure uh all right well my game's called sententia and uh it's a i guess you call it a, a puzzle platformer and you're this little creature who uh well the the theme of the game is growing up and the struggle to keep our imaginations alive as we get older so you start off as this little kid and uh, as you go through the forest you use your imagination to create these bridges to kind of progress through the level and also there's like some action platforming elements and you have to use your words to fight off the other creatures and whatnot. And as you keep going, you get older and older. And uh, I don't want to keep going because I don't want to spoil the game. But that's, that's pretty much the premise of it. So, so what you're saying is there's going to be a shortage of space fighters in this one. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for this, for this one, yes. I had to go back to the old school platforming roots. 
when you're playing, you just, you just go like, wow, I did this. You know, this is insane. It was on my Xbox, on my big H HD TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it feels it feels nice, you know. But I, I was really excited when my first game came out. But as a developer, you, you have to learn to not get too excited, so you can uh, critically look at the game and do some good polishing, you know. So, but it's it's definitely it's really fun to do. I love I love making games for Xbox. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever get unsolicited people just say like, you know, you talk about the Xbox Live indie game market, and you're like, and someone just says, you know, this game is great. You know, you should play this. And you're just like, that's mine. Yeah, that has happened. Actually, something weird that happened is when I came down here to school, like one of the instructors actually played Iron Vengeance 2, which was really awkward, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I I didn't say that I made it. I just kind of kept listening. So I mean, it's cool. It's cool, man. It's Definitely a good experience. Oh yeah, great, uh, great work experience. You know, for anyone looking to get into the games industry, I, this is probably one of the best avenues you could pursue. For a hundred dollars, you have a, a framework, an excellent community. It was very small, but at the same time, very personal. I mean, Mike, would you agree? Like for the most part, if you have an issue on, on a subject, you can go to the forums, which aren't nearly as active as they used to be, but still a very active, vocal Twitter community. Yeah, yeah they're I mean, still, they're the still active. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean. They pretty much taught me how the program, like the XNA community did. Like back when I was That's like 14, I yeah, yeah I, got, I got on the forums, I'd ask questions, and they would be stupid questions, but they would help me out, and I learned through that, you know, with the really tough concepts. And, you know, I was talking to Dave about this earlier, but like I used to do music, and it was so hard. Like none of the press or anybody was approachable. Like it's such a close, hard place to, you know, try to strive or whatever. But the game industry, like everyone's so open with each other, like even the higher up sites, like they want to talk to people like me. You know, it's just such a great community. It's really awesome. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I this is a, a great place to start. I came from the Unreal community first. I was working the Unreal Engine for a few years, and um, it's great. They have very helpful community there and very active forums. But it's like going to a large high school. So you can be a small fish in a big pond, or you come over to XNA and you're like a large fish in a small pond where everyone knows everyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's not a knock against one or the other. You know, it's just it's a very different experience. Um, but as someone who went to a large high school and now I go to a small high school, it's uh, this is more comforting and it's more personalized. That's probably the best way to put it. Yeah. Uh, for someone trying to make the transition, uh, Dave, you said you used to play games a lot, but you made a transition mm -hmm. from gamer to game developer. Could you just give any like hip, uh, hints or tips that you've learned along the way? Um, I, re I read something yesterday that like really hit a good chord with me and it said, um, consume less, create more. And uh, Mike, do you kind of find yourself doing the same thing, playing less games but spending more time learning how to make them now? <laughs> yeah, I really don't play games hardly at all anymore compared to how I did when I was a kid. Yeah, so, I'm in the I same boat. I mean, even though I'm trying to balance like the journalism and development thing, I if I get uh, like an hour and a half, two hours a week to play a game, like that's a lot of time. So they yeah. have all these great, great new games that are coming out, and I'm lucky if I can get any time to play it. But uh, yeah, so I'd say spend time learning how to make games. And from that, you can have a greater appreciation of how people um, make them. And not only that, but you have a, a different eye, a different understanding for how it all comes together. I mean, look at um, Indie Gamer Chick, right? She said like an eye-opening experience for her was listening to James Petruzzi, who made um, – uh, God. Take uh, Arms, I think? Take Arms, yes, which yep. was in the uprising last year. So he wrote a nice long piece on how to do networking and XNA on her, um, on her blog. And then from there, she said she had a greater respect for, you know, XNA and games as a whole because you realize how much work it actually takes to do something like this. So a feature like, oh, just throw in co-op, you realize that's not something you just program overnight. It, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and effort. Um, so, yeah, I would say by even learning or reading how to make games, you can um, have a greater appreciation for them overall, the people behind them and the industry as a whole. So that's that's where I would start. Read a few books and get an understanding of how to create. On the uh, not on the development side, obviously both of you are heavily involved in uh, promoting indie games at this point. Um, and I recently, or not too long ago, wrote an article for a Clearance Interview discussing ways that indie developers often weren't properly uh, promoting their games. What are some advice and some uh, suggestions you'd make out there for the people who are already developing but need to just figure out how to get their games out better? Oh, Mike, you're you're somewhat new to this, so why don't you explain it to him what what you find your be your best approaches, and then I'll go with some of mine. Uh. Well, I mean, the number one thing is to not be too professional, I think. Like, be friendly. Like, every, yes. all the journalists I've ever talked to are, like, super awesome. So don't, like, 
just to email them like you would a good friend type of thing, you know, and, and be brief, like definitely be brief. And because like usually a lot of the people, a lot of journalists, you know, they get a lot of emails. So just be, uh, you know, pretty concise with what you're wanting to tell them and be friendly and uh, try to contact as many as you possibly can. Like do some uh, Google work. Like if you, if you, if you, if you have some good uh, Google foo, uh, you'll be fine. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's yeah. pretty much all I have. <laughs> Uh, my best piece of advice is probably get on Twitter. It's that makes it easier than ever to be active in the gaming industry. And even if you just lurk and follow people for a little bit, that's fine. But just be part of a conversation. You see two people, you know, having some dialogue back and forth. Or, you know, often developers say they're uh, nervous to contact a journalist. And for the most part, I mean, there really is like a small community of journalists who kind of keep to their own little club. But if you're friendly, polite, and even occasionally compliment something I wrote, you know, say something like, hey, I read this article you wrote, um, really hit home for me, and I appreciate it. Thank you. I'd love to see more of that. People don't forget comments like that. You know, you, granted, they don't forget when you knock them down, but at the same time, if someone sees that you're actively going out to help people as well as um, appreciate other people's work, they, they will remember that. So your first interaction with any journalist should not be you pitching your game or trying to get your game out to them. It should be establishing not necessarily a friendly buddy buddy relationship, but just saying, hello, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm working on this. Um, I enjoy your work. All right. So I would say now is better than never to get out there and make yourself known um, and just be friendly and personable because everyone who works in the games industry didn't get there on accident. We're all here because this is what we wanted to do. So they're just as eager to play your games as you are to get them out to them. So uh, that's my best piece of advice for people trying to make games out there. I would, uh, yeah, about, sorry, Michael. I would definitely uh, uh, agree to the Twitter thing. That's been huge for us on there uh, for the site since we started up, and I've met a lot of developers through that. Um, and it's definitely a good avenue to kind of get to know a lot of people in, who are doing what we're doing, especially on the indie gaming scene. That uh, yep. you know, just get to know them on a little bit more personable le- level, and they're going to be a lot more receptive when you do email them that game information. And you know, definitely would like to uh, agree to that. Absolutely. Just be part yeah. of the conversation. And the thing I've noticed is like a lot of the journalists at even the bigger sites, like they want to play indie games. Like they want to play indie games because I find that and I, I've watched a lot of talks with uh, one guy from Ars Technica, I think. But he pretty much said that, you know, oh, they get sick of, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. He was saying that, you know, they get sick of, uh, you know, writing about mainstream games all the time and they actually want to cover indie games. You know, so like a lot of these journalists, you know, they want to play your game. So, you know, don't be afraid to talk to them or anything like that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, and finally, last piece of advice, have your contact information readily available. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I've gone out there to get in touch with the developers, say, hey, I want to cover your game or interview you or something, and they have nothing. Have an email signature, have your information on Twitter, and have a website. They're free. Anyone can make them. You can you can have a WordPress going with all of your stuff on it in under a day, and that's with without any programming knowledge or art skills. So there's no reason for you not to have that. And I can't tell you how many missed opportunities people have had because they don't have a website. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, uh, there was somebody we were trying to contact for the promotion, and I could yep. not find their email. I had like resort to like a YouTube message or something, and that's, that's horrible. Like, yeah. So yeah, and I know they have an email address. I just couldn't find it, right? So My absolute yeah. favorite one is I once tracked down an indie developer whose game I was really interested in. Um, I found them posting on a forum about their game when I did a Google search. I found their name because they had their gamer tag listed. I ended up actually having to contact them through their gamer tag on Xbox to get them to email me. I ended up reviewing their game and I ended up really liking it, but it was just like, I just, if I hadn't really wanted to try out that game, I wouldn't yeah. have gone that far for it. And right. yeah, no, I think I don't have it in front of me, but one of the top things I mentioned in uh, promoting indie games was the sheer amount that don't have websites. It's just baffling. It's crazy, yeah. right? And crazy, I crazy. think I had I a website when I was 14. I just don't get it. Right. <laughs> I know. Same here. That's funny. I made a like a Final Fantasy VII uh, like fan website 1997 on Angel Fire. So if I could do that, <laughs> then you know that was 15 years ago. If I could make that then, yeah. then I don't see why anyone couldn't make a WordPress site now in a, in a day. <laughs> so true. That might be the first Angel Fire reference in roughly a decade. I know, right? <laughs> Before you know it, I'll ask you to join my web ring, and we can all, you know. <laughs> well, hey, I used to use uh, GeoCities. That one's pretty old, too, right? I, that, yeah, that was the alternative. Yeah. I do remember GeoCities. That was my first website, actually. Yeah, same here. So, should should go, we should all go friend each other on MySpace after this. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was just like painful 
uploading stuff on there. You know, you send a picture and it would take like three minutes to upload like a tiny GIF that was, you know, 52 kilobytes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I don't miss those days. I don't <laughs> Me neither. Do you guys still use AOL? What? Well, see, a surprisingly large number of people still use AOL because they're unaware that they can actually cancel that. <laughs> I, I had a I had a writer for a while on the website who actually had an AOL email address. It kind of threw me off every time I had to email him about something. Yeah, you're like you're like this is fake, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this may be a somewhat loaded question, but uh, what game from the uh, uprising list uh, are you guys most looking forward to getting to play in the final build, or do you think? Uh oh, Mike, this one's all you. <laughs> uh okay yeah I'll, I'll start i really i'm a big fan of uh Quirthville, which i that might not be how you pronounce it but it's the snake game <laughs> I, i've already i've already played it it's definitely one of my favorite games to come out this year it's really amazing uh, they're, they're all great though to be honest i mean i i've played through all of them now and i really enjoy all of them like gateways is amazing die hard dungeon's great and trophy's great like they're all good so what about oh yeah. I, I know dave's favorite but i'll let him uh tell you <laughs> yeah uh i mean growing up link to the past was like my favorite game of all time so uh, I've got to go with Die Hard Dungeons. I have no problem saying that because it's so similar. Um, and I can't wait for everyone else to have the opportunity to play. I mean, it's got that top-down perspective. Your character's a similar size, and you're, you're slinging your sword. So I don't know what's not to like about it. It's a beautiful game with its own <laughs> stylized art um, and like silly particle effects that they're all drawn in squares and rectangles. So, um, yeah, as someone who grew up with that kind of gameplay, I look forward to playing more of that and having everyone else have the opportunity to do it also. Well, nobody asked me, but I think I might actually be most oh, excited sure. for City Tuesday. Um, oh, yeah. That's a good that's game. That's a very unique game, I'll tell you that much. Um, and that's actually, um, and it's a great example, actually, going back to uh, about contacting people. Um, Chris, right? I got, I got the name right, Chris? Yes. Yeah, Chris yes. He, um, he actually emailed me a long time ago, actually, with a very early uh, preview of his game. And mm -hmm. at the time, we weren't doing a lot of, like, news coverage, and I actually felt bad that I couldn't, you know, I didn't want to post it because it would have been like the only news article that week or anything yeah. um like we weren't really doing news coverage but i kind of wanted to because it just looked that interesting um and it was kind of you know it was definitely uh, i was happy to see it show up in the uprising partly because it meant it actually got finished and now i'll have a chance to actually play that game oh yeah i mean yeah. i had a opportunity to um play test it some time ago and i've never really played anything like that it runs very smoothly um the art style is is definitely that subscribes to that minimalist architecture you know it's all black and white mm -hmm. for the most part but um it's really got a cool mechanic in that everyone's on a set time schedule throughout their world and you have about five minutes to figure out who is um planting this bomb within your world um so it's, it's small it, it's cute it's a little community i guess cute's the wrong word but it's <laughs> uh, it's very unique in that it's got its own small world and you're just trying to operate within it so i've never seen anything else like that on xblig and um i think you guys will really enjoy that yeah, he uh, he made a request to release the game on Tuesday, and uh, originally, he, he he wanted to release on uh, the day I'm going on 9/11. I was like, uh, Chris, are you sure you want to do that? He's like, he's like, oh, you're right. We shouldn't do that because the bombings and all that. So, uh, crisis averted. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so he's he's yeah, going yeah. the next Tuesday on the 18th. Wow, I, I didn't so. think about that. You're right. Yeah. Say so I'm sort of a uh, looking forward to Xenominer. That looked like it'd be very interesting. Yeah, that's a pretty cool game. Yeah, I haven't played it a ton, but uh, I did play Tesla a little bit a while back. And if you're into the Minecraft type stuff, it's definitely a, a unique take on that. And I, I like sci-fi stuff, so I was all into the space theme that he had going on. Yeah, absolutely. I've been putting quite a bit of work into that for a very long time now. So it's nice to finally get that out to the market, too. It does seem like a lot of the games being featured are games that have been worked on for quite some time. Um, they do all seem to have a very high level of polish. Uh, it's nice to see a selection of games for the uh, channel that are going to definitely be representing it very well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I've got quite a few great games here, so I absolutely cannot wait to get them out there and, and see what everyone has to say. Now, it's the Uprising like does officially start on September 10th? Yes. So yeah, when we get back from uh, PAX. And there are nine games being released uh, on weekdays, not the weekends, right? Yep, yep. Is it planned that uh, all the games released for the Uprising are going to be priced at a dollar? Are they all going to be individually priced? What's the plan on that? Oh, they'll all go for one dollar, uh, with the exception of Gateways, which will also appear on Steam the same day. That's uh, the th Wednesday the 13th. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the 13th. So that's going for um, 240 Microsoft. Yeah, 240 which is three dollars. So you can yeah. either get on Xblig or Steam on that day. But the rest of them are going for one dollar. So overall... Uh, you can buy all nine games for twelve dollars. 
that's less than some of arcade titles. With the exception of a uh, Racketeer, yeah, that was ten dollars. So yeah, basically buy summer arcade game or buy nine awesome X Bligs. So you do buy, buy an <laughs> HD remake of Tony Hawk or <laughs> exactly. nine unique indie games. Yeah, that's a tough uh, sell there you got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, but as I was saying, is there uh, anything else in particular you would like to uh, mention about the uprising? I'm gonna say, if, even if you don't find any uh, happiness in the games in the uprising for whatever reason, still check out Xplig as a whole. We have a ton of great games in that platform. And there's literally something for everybody. Michael, any closing words in that regards? Yeah, I have to second what Dave said. I mean, there's so much stuff that a lot of people have never seen. So hopefully this sparks some interest and people uh, look look in the past a little bit and find some gems that they would enjoy. Steve, any closing questions on your part? Uh, no, I think I just wanted to say thanks, both of you guys, for coming on and talking to us. Thank yeah, you guys. Thanks for having us, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, thank you guys again. Uh, we do plan on doing a lot of coverage for the Uprising this year. Uh, we should be starting a few short days or possibly a few short days ago, depending on when we publish this interview. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, we will be doing previews of every game uh, coming out. We will also be doing uh, developer profiles. And, uh, of course, we will also be reviewing every game as it releases, as well as uh, interviews of all the different developers. So there's a lot to uh, look forward to and a lot going on on CVR in regards to this. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you guys for uh, taking some time to uh, sit down and chat with us and tell us about indie games and indie game uprising and all that fun stuff. Beautiful. No Thanks, problem. guys. We appreciate it. Thanks for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, we appreciate it. It's been a good time.